Good afternoon. Now we're live. Thank you to all those who have been patient with us as we battled a little bit of technical difficulties, but I'd like to welcome you all to this Committee of the Whole meeting and everyone joining us electronically for this Committee of the Whole meeting. Today we are meeting in a physically distant manner at the Highline Hall in the Wellington and District Community Centre to ensure that we are able to maintain a minimum of six feet distance between each other. Committee members and staff who are in attendance here at the Highline Hall should practice physical distancing for the duration of the meeting, including any recesses and after the meeting has been adjourned. Although committee is meeting in person again, the physical meetings are prohibited to the public at this time. This is necessary to maintain distancing and eliminate the gathering of large public groups to protect staff, committee, and the public from the spread of COVID-19. Members of the public are still able to make deputations and comments to the Council electronically. Today's agenda lists all the items before a committee for consideration. The recommended motions on today's agenda are shown in boldface. Copies of the agenda has been posted on our website. This meeting is being live streamed and any participation in the meeting proceedings will become of the public, part of the public record. The recording from the meeting will be published on the county's website immediately and can be viewed by selecting the streaming tab on the county's homepage at thecounty.ca. Under agenda item five, I will be asking for comments from the audience. Members of the public who wish to provide comments at future meetings can do so by contacting clerks at pecounty.on.ca to register. We have two deputations today. When you speak, please state your full name and address your comments to the chair. Following your deputation, there may be questions from members of the committee. Any motion made at this meeting is not final until the council meeting of August 18, 2020, at which time the council may approve, amend, defer, or otherwise change the motion made by this committee. In the event of fire, please use the applicable access in the Highline Hall or wherever you are tuning in from. Please turn off or mute all cell phones and remove your hats. Can I get a motion to confirm the agenda, please? Councillor Nyman, seconded by Councillor Harper. <clears throat> Councillor Nyman, Harper, motion that the agenda for the Committee of the Whole meeting of August 6, 2020 be confirmed. All in favor? And that carries. Is there any disclosure, pecuniary interest, and the general nature thereof? Councillor Harper. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Yes, I have a conflict at uh, 6.7, the discussion of whole home STA application moratorium. Thank you. Is there any others? Thank you very much. Uh, so on to deputations. So 4.1, deputation from Kelly Brace, Student Nutrition Program Coordinator, from the Hastings and Prince Edward Learning Foundation to the address committee regarding the Feed the Meter campaign. Madam Clerk, is she in? Welcome, Kelly. Good afternoon, Kelly, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Sorry, I still had my microphone muted. That's okay, welcome to our meeting. Just a reminder, you have 10 minutes. Very good. Thank you so much, Mayor and Council, for having me back to share with you some of the updates in regards to the operations of our Food for Learning programs. I know you're all very familiar with the Feed the Meter campaign, and, and it's hard to think about the winter, given the glorious weather we're having. But uh, we are in planning mode, and September is right around the corner. And I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about how important our Feed the Meter campaign is gonna be this year now more than ever. Just to go back a little bit, since 2010, Feed the Meter has been one of Food for Learning's key annual fundraisers. And since that time, in Prince Edward County, we've raised almost $24,000. $24, um, and that's just through the parking meters alone. We do get uh, annual sponsors and those funds are used to cover the minimal costs of the campaign which allows us to use 100% of the meter donations to purchase food for local schools. As has other fundraisers become associated with charity that they support, for example, Relay for Life and the Cancer Society or the Kettle Campaign with the Salvation Army. We've worked very hard over the last 10 years to do the same thing with Feed the Meter 
and food for learning. And we appreciate how this fundraiser has allowed every visitor to the downtown area to offer their support and contributions. Every year, so many people reach out to us and say that they had fed the meter and feel good about their contribution. Or they say their child wanted to make a donation and they used their $2 allowance to put in the meter. This is always a, just an example year after year of how every little bit helps and a great reminder to everyone that child hunger exists in our community and together we can, we can help make a difference. Now during a typical school year, schools offer breakfast, lunch and snack programs to students to provide the nourishment they need to help them learn. Any student can participate, there's no criteria or cost. And we know that cognitive ability is impaired when children don't have access to proper nutrition. Through a student nutrition program, students receive food of high nutritional value. Hopefully that will help them develop some lifelong healthy eating habits. They have the opportunity to be part of the school community in a positive way. And by having this nutrition, they're more engaged in their learning, which leads to better um, experiences in the classroom. Student nutrition programs assist with ensuring that every child is on the right path to success. But this year, the world turns on its axis and we're faced with the impacts of the current pandemic. From the moment we heard that schools were gonna be closed due to COVID-19, we sprang into action. We were quick to realize that if students would not be eating at school, we needed to come up with another option, especially to help those families who struggle and rely on the school student nutrition programs. Conference calls and Zoom meetings started happening right away. And soon we had plans in place to help families during the school closure. Then we realized that schools would be closed longer than the two weeks we originally planned. We turned to school principals who together with their staff, they know their students and their families best. We invited them to let us know which families would struggle with food security while schools were closed. We then offered those families a grocery card that would equate to the value of what their child would have received at school, which would be on average 20 breakfasts and 20 snacks per month and a dollar value of $50 per child. This has continued and will continue right through to the end of this month. Food for Learning also provided food banks with snacks at the beginning of the school closure to offer families with school-aged children. And we donated many food vouchers to food banks as families as well. In total, since March 16th, we've provided $343,000 in support to local families in Hastings and Prince Edward. And this equates to just over 274,000 student nutrition meals. And at this point, we don't know all the details of what school will look like for 2020, 2021. But we know for sure that when schools reopen, student nutrition programs are gonna be more important than ever. Students will be coming back with feelings of excitement and eagerness, happy to see their, their, their friends and looking forward to return to normal. But for some, there will also be feelings of fear and uncertainty and sadness. Eating together with peers and teachers will provide a sense of normalcy as they return to school. However, student nutrition programs will need to look very, very different than what they were in the past. There are several factors that will impact some changes that have to be made, some that we've never had to consider before, like the safety and sanitization piece. But the most intimidating to us is the increased cost of food that we'll need to provide. Going forward to ensure safety, we will need to serve only prepackaged and pre-portioned food which in most cases costs up to twice as much per serving. And I'll give you an example. If you consider milk alone, a four liter bag of milk, which is what we would typically use in our programs, it costs around $4.99. That provides 16 students, each with a one cup serving of milk at a cost of 31 cents per serving. We'll now have to move to the individual cartons of milk at a cost of 52 cents per serving, which is a 67% increase. For a school that served 20 students breakfast every morning, 
that school will need almost $800 more a year just for milk. The same increase is expected for individual servings of fruit, vegetables, and other food items. And our preliminary calculations suggest that we may be close to $300,000 short in funding to meet the demands of student needs this upcoming school year. For this reason, we respectfully request that council approve the Feed the Meter campaign and help us to raise these funds that we're going to need to move food for learning programs forward and help feed the students of Prince Edward County. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Kelly, for that deputation. If you just hold on for a few minutes, we will see if there's any questions or comments from committee members. Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for the deputation, uh, a very important deputation. Thank you very much. Um, I certainly agree with your statements that uh, when children eat better, they learn better. I think that's a, a perfect bumper sticker if we have to make it a bumper sticker. Um, and also it's important for you to remind us that um, today that food insecurity and the families at risk in the county, it's a significant concern or should be a con significant concern for all of us. Um, and your particular case underlines another thing, which is that charities and not-for-profits are under a great deal of stress during this pandemic. So thank you for doing that as well. Um, I have two questions. One is, could you remind us of the other programs that are run by the foundation in Prince Edward County? Um, I seem to remember there's something to do with a backpack program. There's an emergency uh, fund, I think. I think there's some other programs. It would be yes, good for there's us. several. You could, I'll deal with the first question then. Go ahead. There are several other programs that are offered through the Learning Foundation. And yes, the Good Backpack Program is one that's coming up uh, very, very quickly in the next few weeks where school supplies and backpacks are provided to students who who don't have access to the funds to buy those. Um, and again, we're still waiting to hear what that program's gonna look like um, given, given the parameters around safety and how we're going to get the products to, to the students, but that will be moving forward. The Student Emergency Fund is a program that um, helps families in urgent situations provide uh, basic needs, um, anything from eyeglasses to medication um, clothing, uh, anything like that that uh, that comes up that's that's an emergency. Um, Food for Home is a is a new program to the Learning Foundation that provides food for families for off school times during the summer, Christmas break, or March break. And Madam Clerk, there we go. Are you going to reconnect her or try? Thank you. Sanitary. 
Oh, that's okay. At least it wasn't something I did. I got a little worried for a minute. Where we left off is you were mentioning something about an emergency fund. So I got as far as the student emergency fund. So that is another program of the Learning Foundation that provides um, funding for urgent needs of students. Anything from clothing, um, often some students will show up in the winter without proper warm coats or boots, um, medicine, eyeglasses, um, anything that comes up from a student that's an urgent basic need, the, the school can apply through the student emergency fund. Um, another branch of the Student Emergency Fund is a new program called Food for Home, where um, food is provided or funding for food is provided for the off-school time. So Food for Learning covers the in-school days and um, families who struggle with food insecurity um, can access the Food for Home program for summer, Christmas and March break times when school is not in session. And then the last program I think uh, to mention is the Prom Project, which is the program in the fall that provides gently used formal wear to kids who might not be able to participate in their prom or graduation events because of financial restrictions. Thank you, Kelly. Those are all very important programs and good for us to, to know about and be reminded Thank of. Thank you. My second question deals with money. Um, You've spent about, if I remember correctly, about $24,000 on food uh, programs or Feed the Meter program, from, coming out of the Feed the Meter program from 2010 to 2019. I think that's in your materials. And you also mention in your materials that your reserves are getting uh, stretched. Could you give us a sense of what that means in terms of um, the state of your reserves at the moment? So. We've, we've, come, we've come into the habit over the last decade of, of using, um, collecting funds in the current year to use the, the, the following year. So we know uh, how much we have to, to rely on and we go into September with a solid budget, um, knowing exactly how much we have to allocate to school programs. And this year we, um, we weren't able to do any of our fundraisers last year, starting in the fall with job action within the education sector and then into the pandemic. So we had to use uh, next year's funding in the current year and exhaust a lot of our reserves that we would have held for the 2021 school year. Thank goodness we were able to access some of the, um, the grants that were available um, and we were able to maintain a high level of support throughout this pandemic but it leaves us short going forward. And given the increased cost of what the next year is going to bring, um, we are anticipating a shortfall. Just to remind you, the, the seed money that we get for our programs comes from the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services from the province. Um, that amount is static and does, has an increase for a number of years. And it's a significant amount of money, but it doesn't address any changes to programs to the human resources within those programs. It takes a lot of people at the schools to run them. Um, so that funding stays the same. And this year we're gonna see a significant increase in costs that will have to come from our own efforts here locally. Thank you. Um, I'm very supportive, Kelly. And when the time comes, if it's appropriate, I'd like to ask for a staff report. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any more questions from committee members? So I'm going to say back to you, Councillor Roberts, with your time has come. So have we moved the, the acceptance? You can do that and add on if you would like to at that point. Excellent. Do I have a seconder? Councillor McNaughton. Councillor McNaughton, this is a Roberts McNaughton motion that the deputation by Kelly Brace, Student Nutrition Program Coordinator from the Hastings and Prince Edward Learning Foundation regarding the Feed the Meter campaign be received. Um, and that a staff report be requested um, for the fulfillment through to the end of the year. Or something like that. Madam CAO. Through the chair, I, th I think that we are prepared to bring that to the um, the next council meeting, so I, I, I it, it's the next council meeting, correct? Yeah. 
or Committee of the Whole. So uh, we, yeah, we, uh, you so can s give us a shorter time frame. It doesn't have to be. I think they need the money sooner than the end of the calendar year. So um, September 1st. Sure. Okay. Thank you. So uh, everybody understands the motion on the floor? All in favor? And that carries. Thank you, Kelly, for your time today. Thank you so much for having me. On to 4.2. Uh, a deputation from Blair Martin, president of Bel Belter Real Estate Partners Limited, and John Fegan, director and officer of Jusco Landscaping Inc., to address committee regarding property impact of the Highway 62 Norris Whitney Bridge Rehabilitation. Hello. Hi, Blair. Welcome to our meeting today. Thank you very much. Uh, just a reminder, you have 10 minutes for your deputation and you're willing, you can start whenever you're willing. Uh, 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 my uh, co-deputy John Fegan is having connection difficulties. He's new to teleconferencing. Okay. And with your permission, uh, Mr. Chair, what I might suggest is I call him on my mobile phone, put that on speaker. Hopefully you can hear him and he can hear you. And that way his part of the deputation is heard because his part of the deputation is very important as well. We'll give it a try. How's that sound? Okay. So I'm going to try and call him now. We've already made this arrangement. Yes. Oh, uh, John, can you just hold on for a sec? Sure. Okay. That works pretty good. <laughs> we'll pretty we'll good. go with that. <laughs> like I said, he's, he's, um, he's never teleconferenced before. Uh, I'm not sure if he's in Madoc or not, and I'm not sure what the connectivity is like out there, but yeah. Uh, so you can hear him. we can hear good Blair. So we'll give you, uh, we got 10 minutes for your deputation. So go ahead and start. Okay, thank you. John, you're still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay, so they can hear you uh, when it's your chance to speak and you can hear me, my part of the deputation as well, okay? Okay, sounds okay. good. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Blair Martin. I'm the president of Belter Real Estate Partners Limited and I'm speaking to you today on behalf of Jusco Landscaping Inc., the owner of the property at 556. Six eight Highway sixty two, and Belter Developments Inc., who has the agreement of purchase and sale with Justville Landscaping uh, related to this property. Um, I know you have as part of this deputation two letters. One is a letter dated July seventeenth that Belter Real Estate Partners sent to the Ministry of Transportation regarding this issue, and the second is a letter dated August the 4th, 2020, which was sent by MTO to the Chief Administrative Officer of uh, Prince Edward County. And I won't be referring specifically to those letters in my deputation, um, but my deputation is based on the issues raised in those letters. Uh, I have uh, th kind of three uh, areas of concern that I think uh, just for Landscaping Inc., Bell Terrace Development Inc., and the Prince Edward County share uh, in trying to resolve this problem. And I'm calling it a problem as opposed to impacts because I think the impacts go beyond the affected properties. And the, the two of the concerns are framed around what I'm calling the guiding principles to resolve the problem. And specifically, the first is an acknowledgement of what all the impacts are. Uh, MTO has to uh, acknowledge that there are impacts beyond the properties that are affected. And the second part is the residual cost of uh, solving the problem. And the third area of concern is um, what approach should be used to inform the detailed design that might be considered to solve the problem. 
So with respect to the first concern, uh, there are properties that are affected by the improvements that are being recommended. Uh, we know what those are. Uh, we know what the effect is on this property. But I think there's an acknowledgement, there should be an acknowledgement from this council and, and then MTO in turn that, you know, the people on Hennessy Street who uh, aren't affected by any of the improvements uh, will see a dramatic change in the way the local municipal right-of-way infrastructure is used are directly impacted by these improvements. And I think those people should be part of the stakeholder and engagement process. And I hope that uh, this council shares uh, that opinion as well. Uh, when I talk about the residual cost of solving the problem, uh, you know, there's a line item in a budget somewhere that says, uh, we know we're gonna have to uh, acquire some property or make some other improvements to implement the recommended plan. And here's the number we're carrying. But in order to actually get the uh, problem resolved, uh, a fulsome uh, resolution, uh, they're going to have to spend more money. And, and what they're looking at is the delta between what they had budgeted and what it's really going to cost them. And I want to put that in the context of the budget for this project. So at the last, uh, at the meeting of the Committee of the Whole on June the 25th, uh, Councillor Margerson asked the project managers what the cost of the project was, and it was called 150 to 200 million dollars. Now, when people hear 150 to 200 million dollars, they might be thinking about the full scope of the project. When I hear that, I look at what the rounding is, the rounding threshold for this project. So the rounding threshold is in the tens of millions of dollars, and that should be no surprise to anybody who's dealt with projects of this size. Uh, the, the residual cost to solve the specific impact to this property and other properties, I would consider in the context of the rounding threshold, not even show up as a rounding error in this budget if this project is to go forward. And I think MTO in discussing solutions and meeting with stakeholders has to keep that in mind. We will definitely be keeping that in mind. I hope this council will be keeping that in mind as well. And the last concern is uh, in MTO's letter, um, and I'll, I'll specifically reference, it's the second last par paragraph on page two, that the new access is going to be designed to meet the existing, the demands of the existing land use. And I think that approach is unfair to JUSCO because uh, there are other permitted uses in that RU zone, and I can read them to you. Uh, there's an agricultural processing establishment, an agricultural produce warehouse, an abattoir, an aerodrome, a cheese factory, farm and garden machinery sales and service, and on and on. Uh, each of those has a different demand, a traffic demand, and I think MTO in doing its detailed design has to consider the worst of all of those uses, all of those land uses, in informing what the detailed design should be specific to this, specific to this property. And those are my comments, and I'll now uh, pass it on to John. Hi, um, I'm John Fagan. I don't, I can't, I can't hear you. If you, uh, I'm waiting to be accepted to join the meeting. I don't know if the committee member can do that. Uh, anyways, uh, my biggest concern was the truck traffic. For I, I don't know if you guys know, but uh, the neighbors are generally not happy with me as it is, and uh, we can get quite a few truck uh, trucks in and out a day, especially a half load season. Because uh, me and probably twenty other contractors, we use that yard for uh, loading and unloading. So we get full loads there, and then we ship armor stone mulch, topsoil, stuff like that, half loads down, uh, Renderstill Road, Massasauga Road. Uh, so my biggest concern is uh, you're going to switch me from a full load road that uh, I use 12 months a year to a half load road that I can't use for three months a year. That that means I have to find a different place to do business three, three months a year. So it makes it pretty hard on me. And I don't know if anybody's seen how much truck, tra truck traffic can go through there when 
Fitzgibbon or Cocoa Paving or Trenton Paving or whatever is working out of my yard, you know, we could have up to 50 trucks a day. And I'm sure the neighbors wouldn't be very happy with 50 trucks a day going by their house. Um, unfortunately, I can't hear back from you. So uh, uh, I hope you take that in consideration. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I will ask committee if there is any comments or questions for either one of you at this time. Councillor Margaretson. Yes, thank you. Um, my question is related to, well, it's to both of you, but it's related to the use of the alley to service the site. And you've noted, Blair, in your uh, written correspondence. By the way, we didn't get the correspondence from MTO to the municipality that you referenced. Um, but further to my question, you say that the alley is not currently designed to accommodate two-way truck traffic, and that was further identified by the owner of Jusco. Now, if MTO upgraded that road to accommodate truck traffic, and that was part of the process of twinning the bridge, that would give access on an acceptable um, road to access the site for the 12 months of the year. There could be accommodations included for noise mitigation. So I'm wondering if, if the use of the property stays as it is under the existing zoning, if, a, a, if an upgrade to the alley would satisfy your needs. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. John, did you hear the comments and the, the question? I, I could hear some of it, yes. Okay, so uh, the, the question was, if the road, if the alley is redesigned to accommodate uh, full movements of your trucks uh, for 12 months a year, which you suggested you need, uh, is that satisfactory? Where would, where would the entrance be? Well, it would be it would be the alley out to the intersection at uh, Highway 62 and County Road 3. Okay. Well, the the alley actually runs uh, parallel with my property and runs right to 62 Highway. But it'd be where the alley really is, or where the forest road is now, because the alley actually comes out probably 50 feet away from the end of my driveway. To 62 Highway. Yeah, uh, Councillor Margerson, uh, through the chair, the, the, the alley right of way actually does go from it. It it, it is um, it's a closed right of way that goes from the property down to Highway 62. So when John's talking about the alley, it is that uh, unopened right of way. Uh, yes, I'm aware of the unopened portion of the alley, but if MTO were to um, access land requirements to upgrade the road within the scope of the intersection improvements of County Road 3 and 62 and the alley. They could do that within the scope of this project. It would address your issues with costs and it could be covered in the environmental assessment where your option one that you've presented in your letter which entails um, utilizing another parcel of land not owned by the proponent to access their land would not be covered in the environmental assessment and the cost wouldn't be covered. So I'm suggesting that you've outlined that the alley is ins insufficient right now or inadequate and perhaps the way to address this is to ensure that MTO looks at that as an option by upgrading that road in the scope of their intersection improvements. I can't speak, I, mean, I think this, John's having difficulty through all of this, but, and I can't speak to, to his, we haven't discussed this as, as a group, uh, and I don't want to speak for him as to whether or not he's satisfied with his trucks going down that road and the impact on the neighbors. But I'll go back to my, I'll, go back, I'll just go back to my comment about the, acknowledging the full impact of this change. And, uh, I would like everyone in that community to know in advance 
of those changes and how those changes will impact them. And notably, you know, the movement of possibly 30 to 50 trucks a day on a road that presently doesn't see any truck track. Uh, so it isn't just a, it isn't just a decision that JustGo has to make that it is satisfied. I think the community in there as a whole has to be satisfied that this change uh, doesn't affect them in a negative way. Thank you, Blair. I, th I think we're, we're under the understanding of the alley and the concerns of JustGo. Um, is there any other questions from committee? Councillor Maynard? Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Chair. Um, through you, so... Can I say something? Can you just... Um, I don't know. Hold on one sec. Let Councillor Maynard ask her question, and then maybe she'll lead you into something. So, Councillor Maynard, go ahead. Okay. So, in the, uh, okay. le in the letter that, uh, that you're submitting to the MTO, it indicates, I mean, we just talked about truck traffic, but I think the... Um, it says if BDI purchases a property and tends to seek a zoning amendment that would allow retail and commercial uses, which really has been kind of long anticipated for that uh, for that uh, stretch of the highway. So how do the two options or other options play into that scenario? Because what we heard was just about truck traffic, not about uh, traffic from a uh, commercial from a commercial center. Maybe that one is to the BDI rep. Did you hear the question, Blair? It, it, that was very difficult to understand, Mr. Well, Chair. Well, it's because I, I'm just asking about the, in the letter to the MTO, it suggests that if the um, land tr exchange happens, that you will have, uh, that it'll be now a request for, uh, for a commercial site as opposed to a, uh, a site that would have trucks going in and out of it. Oh, so the question is, would Belterre Development Inc. be satisfied with those improvements if it's successful in getting a rezoning? Yes. Yes. Oh, um, uh, yeah, yes. I mean, it, it's something, uh, is it ideal? No. Uh, would we accept it? Yes. Thank you. Is there any more questions from committee? Seeing I none. I do have a question. Okay. Did you want to say one more thing? Because since I cut you off early, you can say you get the last word. Go ahead, John. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you guys know, but Prince Edward County has already removed my rear entrance into the building on Hennessy Street because of flooding and how poor the road system is back there. Uh, We've had to retrieve two transports out of the ditches already this year, and Prince Edward County knows about this because of the damage. There's no way to get a 53-foot trailer around Hennessy Street without going in the ditch. There's no way. So if you think you're getting 10 or 15 of them a day down that street, I just I don't see how it's ever going to happen. Thank you for those comments. I'm sure if if something like this does happen it would have to be upgraded to meet standards of of the business that's happening now so uh notes are taken we thank you guys for your comments uh, and i will ask for somebody to accept this deputation at this time councillor margaretson councillor nyman thank you mr chairman this is a margaretson nyman motion that the deputation by blair martin President of Belterre Real Estate Partners Limited, and John Fagan, Director and Officer of Jutco, Jusco Landscaping Incorporated regarding property impact of the Highway 62 Norris Whitney Bridge rehabilitation be received. All in favor? And that carries. Thank you again. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, at this time, we will move to comments from the audience. There has been one comment from the audience uh, registered with Madam Clerk. So today it's Jason Reed who is speaking to item 4.2 on our agenda, the deputation by Blair Martin. Jason, can you hear me? Jason, can you hear me? 
Jason, I think you're on mute. Okay, are we good? Yeah, I can hear you now. Welcome, Jason. Thank you for coming. Uh, just a reminder, you have three minutes. Okay, we just wanted to join the meeting just to uh, obviously represent Prince Edward Square's uh, interest in, in this. And and uh, obviously, along with uh, with John Fagan, you know, we are going to be impacted uh, as well with the uh, widening of, of Highway 62. Um, uh, we understand, obviously, uh, I guess what, what John's going through there and, and what's going to need to happen uh, with his access. Um, all I wanted to add to this is that uh, we notice on uh, the submission that uh, option one would be to have an access directly across from uh, the most northerly uh, entrance to Prince Edward Square. Um, in conversation with MTO uh, as of late and as well in the past, um, any changes there would require signalization of that, uh, of that intersection. Uh, in addition to that, if that were to happen, um, MTO would uh, require us to uh, eliminate uh, the south access into Prince Edward Square, uh, which would, uh, you know, really impact, um, you know, the south end of the development, uh, including LCBO. Um, so obviously that that is an issue with us. Um, and obviously we don't want to see that happen. Um, you know, with MTO uh, proposing to, and from what I understand, um, uh, rebuilding the access from the alley at an existing intersection, uh, I know from MTO point of view makes more sense. Uh, they definitely do not want um, uh, traffic lights along their corridor if they can help it uh, with, with uh, conversations in years past with other development we, we had wanted to do there. Um, we did have a conversation obviously today uh, regarding um, reducing the speed limit through that through that zone and uh, they certainly will not even uh, consider that so that causes some issues there as well but um, really that's that's all we wanted to do today was just uh, have a few comments there and and uh, join in the meeting but thank you very much thank you jason for taking the time just hold on a sec i'll see if there's any questions from committee members Councillor Margetson. Thank you, Councillor Prinzen. Uh, thank you, Jason. I, it's a very simple question. I'm, I just want to be clear that the preferred option presented by Bell Terror is not your preferred option because it would eliminate one of your entrances. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Any other and questions? I guess in addition to that, uh, sorry, in addition to that, if, if in fact that you know, ended up being uh, the be all and end all. Yes, we have to have a signalized intersection there. Then uh, the northerly uh, entrance for us would not make sense. We would obviously need to construct a new access to Prince Edward Square, you know, sort of in the middle of the property, which would, you know, clearly shift that south. Um, so, you know, if it was designed that the access to the, uh, the Jesco property, you know, had to be in directly opposite our access, it would need to you know, in our point of view, would need to shift south. Thank you, Jason. Uh, is there any other questions? Uh, seeing none, thank you, Jason, for taking the time today to come. And I will look for a mover and a seconder to uh, accept a comment from the audience. Fuck. Thank you. Councillor Margetson, Councillor Nyman. Margetson, Nyman motion to accept the comments from the audience on items on the agenda. Thank you. All in favor? And that carries. Thank you very much. On to items for consideration. Uh, 6.1, the report of development services department dated August 6, 2020 regarding speed reduction and designated one-way streets in Wellington. Can I have somebody put that on the floor? Councillor Harper and Councillor McNaughton. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, Harper McNaughton motion that council receive report DS 86 2020 and that a bylaw be brought forward to, to not to amend the rate of speed bylaw 4473 2019 scheduled E 20 kilometers an hour to include Beach Street from Wellington Main Street to 540 meters easterly. Number three that a bylaw be brought forward to enact 
to amend the regulating traffic on highways through the installation of traffic signs bylaw 2262-2008 schedule b to include west street between wellington main street and water street wellington ward one wellington ward one-way street for southbound traffic four that a bylaw be brought forward to enact to amend the regulating traffic on highways through the installation of traffic signs bylaw 2262-2008 Schedule B to include Water Street between West Street and Narrow Street, Wellington Ward One Way Street for westbound traffic. Five, that a bylaw be brought forward to enact to amend the regulating traffic on highways through the installation of traffic signs bylaw 2262 2008. Schedule B to include Narrow Street between Water Street and Wellington Main Street, Wellington Ward One Way Street for northbound traffic. Six, that a bylaw be brought forward to enactment to amend the and regulate the control parking bylaw 4249-2018 schedule number 12 to include West Street, East Side from Wellington Main Street to Water Street, no parking at all times. Seven, that a bylaw be brought forward to enact to amend the regulate and control parking bylaw 4249-218 schedule number 12 to include West Street, west side from Wellington Main Street to a distance 15 meters southerly, no parking at all times. Number eight, that a bylaw be brought forward to enactment to amend the regulate and control parking bylaw 4249-218, schedule 12 to include Water Street, both sides from West Street to Narrow Street, no parking at all times. Nine, that a bylaw be brought forward to enactment to amend the regulate and control parking bylaw 4249 dash 218 schedule 12 to include narrow street both sides from water street to wellington main street no parking at all times and may i just speak quickly to it could i have a drink of water first please i was going to ask you to re reread it in case somebody missed something um i have to say i was um i was pleasantly surprised to see this on the list um it's something that we had talked about in traffic committee. I know Councillor Nyman will have something to say about it, which uh, I certainly respect. But given the um, the problems that we're having in Wellington, it was nice to see that we were able to, through COVID, move on this. Uh, it was in the hopper. Um, it's it's something that all the residents on all three of those streets have been um, after me about for well over a year. Um, we have, uh, as you know, and even more so this year, great uh, congestion problems and. Um, and I think this one-way street uh, looping people around and out over by Cal Tire is, uh, uh, is going to do a, a lot to help alleviate some of the congestion and the, and the safety issues that we have there. And uh, in addition to that, the parking, I think, also uh, reflects a good understanding of, of uh, the problems. And, uh, you know, narrow streets, not called narrow street for, you know, for good reasons. Um, it, it's just, you know, the whole area is uh, really narrow little streets that cannot accommodate parking on both sides. So I feel strongly that this is a great um, um, solution and uh, thank you to staff uh, for uh, bringing it forward. Thank you, Councillor Harper. Uh, Councillor Nyman. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so it's a surprise to see this on the agenda because and it did at the traffic committee we did have a quick discussion on it and staff is supposed to bring a report back to the committee and instead of coming to the traffic committee we see it here at committee of the whole so the process uh, we seem to be skipping process again and I can't figure out uh, why we're doing that so that would be the one question is why we want to skip processes all the time <coughs> And so I have two questions is the one question and then I'll have a, another comment at the end. How many SDAs are on those streets, I guess would be the question. Do we have that information? Would somebody have it or Ainsley? <laughs> Yeah, through you, Chair, I, I don't know, I'm not sure how many STAs are, are along that, uh, along that stretch. Um, I don't have that information, sorry. Okay. Um, so my understanding or the way I understand it is basically just from the spring to the fall is where we're having the traffic problems. 
So my question to staff, I guess, is, and I understand we, we put the information into the computer and it rolls it around, spits it out, and that's gospel. Whatever comes out of that computer is gospel, I guess. But every situation is different. So if, some, if a resident is there, we have no parking on those streets, and they don't have room in their uh, driveway, and they have family come, where are they going to park? First of all, that's just for the residents of Wellington. Now, when we look at the bigger picture and all those cars that are parking there, where are we going to push them? If we can't park there, we put no parking there at all, where are we going to push the cars to? Somewhere else on another street, and then we're going to come back here and say, oh, we got a problem over here, and now we have to have no parking over here. I don't think it's very well thought out right now. And the knee-jerk reactions, we just seem to be uh, trying to solve a problem, but we end up creating more problems. So, I guess the question is, where we're going to put the um, where we're going to put the push the cars to? Somebody from staff want to take a shot at where Councillor Nyman wants to know where we're going to put the cars? Ainsley, did you hear me okay? Sorry, you're you're cutting out a little bit. I think I missed the end of the. That's, a, of that's the okay. I'll I'll summarize. Councillor Nyman's wondering if we limit the parking on those streets and make it no parking, where do you suspect the cars are going to go from that point? Um. It, that's fine if it we it's okay yeah. that was just uh, councillor councillor harper might he's got his hand up so i'll let him take a crack at it uh, yeah brad's making some you know some important points but i will say that the residents are also asking for no parking that it's it's really a function of there should have never been parking anyway they're just too narrow the streets are too narrow and on Water Street, we have the the embankment is caving in because of high water, so there's really very little land between the street for them to park on anyway, and so there's a bit of a, a safety issue. And I think safety trumps, um, um, you know, convenient parking. I think we just we have a general need for a parking study for Wellington anyway, and there will be some greater thought given to how do we deal with all the cars. But from the standpoint of flow and safety. And I do put safety as number one, and that would be probably the main reason that people have been asking me for it, is that, that this, I think, helps to address that. Just the, the behavior, basically, is people come in and um, um, there is a, um, uh, there's a bike shop there. Uh, there's many shops all around there. It's an extremely tight um, part of the, the downtown. People go down that street. They thought they were going to uh, the Drake. They realized they couldn't. They tried to do a U-turn or a three-pointer there, and they come back up on the main street, and they just really messed the whole thing up. So the flow is, uh, is a little bit about tourism for sure, but it also for residents uh, helps as well. It just, I think, solves uh, some of the general problems that they have getting back out onto Main Street. If you try to get out on Main Street, at West Street, you will find it very dangerous. There's an elevation change, which makes sightline very difficult. So um, certainly the one-way street, I think, is a no-brainer. Uh, Brad is right that there's still a broader parking issue, but I think safety trumps convenience for visitors. I'll, uh, I just want to, just for my own clarification too, the two, let's call them side streets, not the water street, but it's only one side parking. So we still have parking on one side. So I know that's not perfect or ideal, but that's it's not the no parking that I just battled on Tuesday night. So there is still one side of parking. Is there more questions or comments from committee? Councillor Margotson? Just to clarify, there's parking on one side of West and Narrow and no parking on water. water. Right. Because water only has one side of the street and the other side well, is along the water. Depends, yeah. Um, what risk you want to take but so uh, as long as I I think you said Councillor Harper that those streets were never designed for two-way traffic they're too narrow but I I must admit as long as I can remember there hasn't there never was a problem with those little streets we use them all you know if we had to go down and visit somebody but I think the issue is here we have too many cars 
too many people that need a place to park. It's close to the downtown, so now we have an issue that we have to deal with it. Because I don't mind the narrow street. I mean, you can pull over and let somebody buy, but that's not, it's just too much now. Uh, so, you know, I'll support the motion. I think it's unfortunate it didn't go back to traffic committee because I would have thought it could have benefited from perhaps input from other members, the police or whatever, but I, I understand the dilemma you're in with, with traffic, congestion, number of cars, people parking where they shouldn't, so I'll support the motion. Councillor Nyman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I guess one other point that I wanted to make, when we had this little discussion, uh, that quick discussion, there was other options that were made available to uh, leave the, the parking issue, I guess, or come to a, a common ground. Whereas, you know, you could park on one side of the road um, for half the month and the, the other half will park on the other side. And that still gives people a chance to park, still keeps traffic moving. And for some reason, it seems to fall on deaf ears. It works in other municipalities quite well. And sometimes it's a, a revenue generator. People park in the wrong spot and one half of the month, they get the ticket. And it's funny that, that on down the um, items here, we're having one about uh, tourists. Uh, how are we going to what's best for the, the county, the tourists coming is good for the businesses, but it don't do anything for county coffers. And it's mostly the tourists that are parking on these streets. And if they, you put a plan like that in place, you can make money from the tourists. That's gonna go into the county coffers. We're not getting nothing from them. So that whole point was just missed. And like you say, it should've went back to the traffic committee so you have bigger discussion, but I can't support it the way it is. <clears throat> Councillor McMahon. Chair, sure. yeah, I, I, I too am on the traffic committee and, and I was rather surprised that this ended up the agenda because we did discuss it and we were expecting staff to bring something back to the traffic committee. Uh, like Councillor Nyman has stated, he did mention the, the option of parking on both sides of the street and alternating it during the month and this happens quite well in Toronto, believe me. I got many a ticket from parking on the wrong side of the street uh, the whole time I lived there. Um, and you know what else? I'm, I'm getting a little Wellington weary right now in this horseshoe. Um, I'm a little tired of how Wellington just keeps getting pushed in front of us and then doesn't go through the proper procedure. Um, so I would, I cannot support this and I would like to go back to staff and have it come through the traffic committee. Thank you. Um, through you, the chair, um, I did want to point out that I, I went through the minutes for the traffic committee and for this report, there was no request for a report to go back to the traffic committee. Uh, the report or uh, the request was received and then sent to staff to then go ahead and bring it bring upon our solution to the committee of the whole but there was no request to uh, write a report to bring back to the traffic committee thank you for those comments I see councillor Nyman again go ahead yeah this will be the last time I speak on it usually when we request a, or at the traffic committee when we request a report it comes back to the traffic committee so we have an idea what's going on when we get here and it just shows up and we have no idea what's happening, that just makes everybody look foolish. It just, the uh, processes are there. You've got to follow them. So it's just, uh, I don't know. Point, it's, point, we get, we point taken and at least we know at traffic now, if you wanted to come back to traffic, we had the word in traffic. Uh, we'll let some more comments. Councillor Hirsch. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, that wouldn't be the only error in the minutes for that particular meeting. There'll be another one that I'll be I'll be raising, and of course the committee hasn't even had a chance to see those minutes yet because it hasn't hasn't met since the September 29th, um, 20, 2019 meeting. But a question, I guess, for staff is: If we were to approve this today, how quickly would these changes be made? Would it be made immediately? Is the idea to have effect for this for the remainder of this season? 
because um, if that's not the case, then I'd be happy to have this go back to traffic committee for reconsideration of some of the points that Councillor Nyman's raised, um, so, unless it is an urgent need. So to this, which staff member would like to take a shot? When will these take place? I'll look at Madam CAO and... Peter, uh, Peter Moyer's on the line. Peter, can you answer that question? I have to apologize. I can only really make out about every fourth word. There's a lot of echo. Okay. And I'll, I'll give I, you a summary, Peter. How's that sound? Can you hear me? I can hear you. The question is, when will this come into effect if this motion passes? What happens after we get council approval on these items is a directive gets written over to operations department and they actually do the work to to install the signs and uh, so it falls into their schedule. So um, don't think there's any special order on anything like this. Like there's no lights necessarily to order. It's really just signage, which they should have in stock. So it really uh, depends on um, on the priority they place it or the priority they're told to make it. So, so it would be at least two weeks out to the council meeting where it needs its final approval, which would be the 18th. And then it goes to operations, which could be another week or so. So we're looking at the end of the month. And realistically, that's probably as early as it could be. Am I being fair in those statements? Yeah, I, I would say that's, um, you know, giving them a week to do it is, is uh, they're busy too. That would yep. be typical. That would be ideal. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So we're looking at at least the end of August for clarity on the question. Councillor Maynard. Speak, speak loud right into you No, know, I am. Yeah, I wasn't turned on. Um, so just for clarification, because I've heard of So there, there's only going to be s parking on West Street on the east side and no parking on Water or Narrow Street at all. I thought it says to include Narrow Street, both sides from Water Street to Main Street, no parking at all West times. Street, West Side. Yeah. And, uh, and Water Street, both sides, and um, Narrow Street, both sides. West, sorry, West Street, East Side, mm -hmm. West Street, West Side, and Narrow, no parking at all. So the two roads leading down to Narrow would have one side parking if I'm reading this correctly. Can I, can I just, can we just have some clarification from staff? Cause we're reading this differently. Yeah. Uh, so through you, the chair. So there'll be, there'll be no parking on narrow or water. And then there'll be parking on just the West street, um, on West street on the West side. Uh, 50, starting 15 meters from the intersection. And uh, so my next question is, is because this is coming to us kind of outside of the, the larger parking plan, would it be um, possible or maybe a wise idea to, uh, to implement this, but to review it in, uh, in six months? Because, I mean, there I would say that there's been probably a little bit of, you know, there hasn't been full public consultation. People are going to be taken out. So I'm just wondering whether a six month review of this might, uh, might be helpful. Madam CAO. Through, through the chair. So uh, we are doing a parking study. So I would say that all of our, um, uh, settlement area of um, areas that are subject to that parking study will be impacted potentially by any the recommendation so it might affect other parking bylaws at the same time but you certainly could add a clause to um, either make this temporary and time limited or uh, ask that it be reviewed and brought back to council sorry through you mr chair um, so if the idea was to, to have it looked at in, um, at a later date, which would be the which would be the preferred option to make it temporary or to just review it in relation to the master parking plan? Temporary or review is the question. 
I understand the question. I'm trying to figure out what the answer is. So uh, I, I would say that um, the parking study is expected to come in uh, sometime in the fall, and then we would be reviewing. Uh, this is trying to solve a problem that's uh, heavily exacerbated during the tourist season. So I think if, if this expired, um, uh, you know, towards the end of the tourist season or the end of 2020, I think that would be fine. Uh, that's probably around the time we'll be revisiting all of the uh, bylaws and and parking at the same time. Uh, I'd also just draw attention that, that while we've had a long conversation about the three roads that is the bulk of this, uh, there's a uh, clause two, which is about changing the speed limit to Beach Street. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that council was, didn't miss that um, nuance here. Uh, that similarly uh, came as part of this report um, in, as a, an attempt to address a urgent need related to the way uh, people are careening into the parking area where we have the staff booth set up that is now collecting the $20. I'll be the first to admit that all of these are um, a number of short-term fixes that are reactive in nature, and I think um, the, the motion later in the agenda around trying to take a more proactive, comprehensive approach. We're trying to do that with the parking study, but uh, I believe there's uh, other issues in the Wellington space and, and beyond that we'll have to deal with more comprehensively. Thank you, Madam CAO. Councillor Nyman. The one thing I was going to ask, thank you, Mr. Chair, was that we vote on that number two separate because I, I could go along with that. I could support that being the problems that we're having with Beach mm -hmm. Street. So if we could separate the motion. All right, Councillor Harper, did you have one more comment? In favor of looking at this, sorry, I'd be in favor of looking at it as a as a temporary. Uh, in my mind, I'm a big fan of pilot projects. It's you know you can talk about things forever. Um, you know sometimes you just have to try them out and see if they work. And I would like to at least try this out. And I I do appreciate that process is important, but process is not the objective. Process is a way to get to some good decisions. So and I think this is an important decision to make now. Um, that's it. Is there any more comments before I add my two cents worth? So I, I too, uh, think the Beach Street one is a, is a no-brainer. Um, I'll, I'll go on. I'm not on traffic, so I knew nothing about this. I do like process. So that's one issue I have. And the other issue I have is it'll probably be Labor Day before this is done. And I know our shoulder seasons are extending, but I'm my prediction is our numbers will go down after Labor Day. So that's that's one of my big concerns. So I would support the obviously the report and the number two. And I understand how quickly we want this to happen, but it was should we wanted it yesterday, and that's not going to happen. It's probably going to be Labor Day, so I won't support the rest of it at this time till it goes back to traffic. So I will. Councilor Nyman, did you want to break this uh, motion apart and vote on vote on it separately if we can? So if I could have um, the vote on number two, take number two and vote on it separately from the rest of it, if I could. Councillor Roberts has seconded that. Are we going to put one and two together, Madam Clerk, or or you want to go ahead? For me. Uh, okay, so is there any questions on number two? Didn't seem like there was any the first time, so I will call all in favor of 6.1 part two. And that carries. So now we will go back to the original motion that is on the floor. We've had lots of discussion. Is, is there one? Any more discussion? Councillor Nyman? Did Councillor McMahon, did he make that motion or, or no, that it goes back to? Staff? Is that Traffic did, committee? Yeah. Go ahead, Madam Clerk. 
So through you, the chair, the motion would read that Report DS-86-2020 Save and Accept Clause 2 be referred to staff to be reviewed by the Traffic Advisory Committee for review and comment. Right. And that's a McMahon-Nyman motion, I believe. Councillor Roberts, would you like to speak to that? Yes, I would, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I tend to agree with Councillor McMahon that Wellington is becoming a bit of our epicenter for stressful issues and exceptionalism. And I agree with Councillor Nyman that process is important. We do have Item 6.5 coming up, the aforementioned process concerns, the traffic study, and as Councillor Prinzen mentioned, I think he's being optimistic by Labor Day. I will support the reference back to the Traffic Committee. Thank you. Any more comments? Seeing none, I will call the vote. On Councillor... Everybody good with that? All in favour? Councillor Bullock, how do you vote? In favour of. That's seven. So I would say that carries. Thank you. Moving on to 6.2. Report of Development Services Department dated August 6, 2020 regarding request for proposal engineering services for Wellington water and wastewater improvements. Could I have somebody please put that on the floor? Councillor Nyman, seconder. Councillor Margaretson. Uh, it's a Nyman uh, Margaretson motion. Uh, where am I? That council receive report DS 85 2020 for information and that the consulting engineer firm of RV Anderson Associates Limited be selected for the design services for project one in the amount of $111,426.55 plus all applicable taxes and that RV Anderson Associates Limited be retained for the contract administration association with project one once a contract for construction has been awarded by the county and that a bylaw to authorize the execution of the agreement between the county of Prince Edward and RVA or RV Anderson Associates Limited be approved and that the consulting engineering firm of IBI Group Professional Services Canada Inc. be selected for the design services of project two in the amount of $198,906 plus applicable taxes and that council authorized staff access to the funds approved in the 2020 budget for the elevated water tank, water main trunk or water main tank and sanitary trunk as well as approve a contingency of 10% of the value of each contract for any required expenses not covered by the agreement that a bylaw to authorize the execution of an agreement between the County of Prince Edward and IBI Group Professional Services Canada, Inc. be approved. Thank you, Councillor Nyman. Uh, just for clarity on number five, you said water main. You were going to say trunk and you flipped the tank. It's supposed to be trunk. So you had it right the first time, I thought. Very well done. And then you switched on me. So I just wanted to make sure that was that was noted. Is there any questions or comments to staff on item 6.2? Seeing, oh, Councillor Maynard. Just, look, just looking to see um, if anybody else. So I would have preferred to have a little bit of an overview on this because I think we, uh, reading through it, it's, 
it's a little um, it's a little challenging. Um, in the first paragraph in the analysis where it says, following the receipt of this report, council directs staff to engage in negotiations regarding possible agreements for cost sharing for infrastructure upgrades with parties proposed in the major developments in Wellington. So is the, the services that we are actually um, getting from these, from the two consultants being project one and project two, at this point, are they just the um, the services that would have been anticipated under the um, water wastewater uh, rate study? To like, is that all that's that we are um, anticipating in project and project two at this time? Just, like the, just the just uh, the just the portions that needed to be that are being done outside of the uh, broader expansion possibilities. Who on staff? Peter, maybe. Peter, did you hear the question from Councillor Maynard? Peter, can you hear me, Peter? Joe, can Joe hear me? Sorry, what was that? Uh, I did have you, I just lost it a minute ago. I heard it, but it wasn't very clear. It was all gar it was garbled on my reception here. Councillor Maynard, do you want to give him a <laughs> brief summary um, again? So, per or perhaps you could uh, could you refrain it, uh, Catalina, and I could address it. So, I'll I'll try and do it in a in a um, more concise manner. So the two the the. Two contracts that we're letting for um, for services are they based at this point entirely on what we would have seen in the um, master in the servicing plan without the uh, full expansion, or are they anticipated to include further expansion? It's like what are, what are these guys actually going to be? Which what are they actually going to be doing? He can't hear me. So, yeah, Madam CAO. Yes. <laughs> yes, I'm going to try. So I yes. know that the water main is uh, sorry. The water tank is uh, required regardless right. um, of growth. We are upsizing. Mm -hmm the size of the water tank, knowing that there is a lot of growth contemplated. Um, if there had been no interest and, and no way under land use planning that you could grow Wellington, that would have been a smaller tank. But we're building a, uh, a larger tank, and that was part of the uh, master servicing plan EA work that was done and consulted on uh, last year. The uh, water main and sewer main work is required um, uh, anyways as a result of connecting in this tank. I would say that we might have chosen a different location for those um, water mains, sewer mains to be uh, put in uh, if there had been no growth contemplated. But what we are trying to do is um, do the portion that is uh, outside of what uh, is obviously growth related and uh, and 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 therefore continue to move forward on this project. Uh, this is the work that was contemplated as um, part of that EA work, so it has been consulted on, and we are at the place. It was part of this year's budget in order to move forward. Um, we are modifying uh, the, the 
engineering and the plans for this so that it can work well with a growth related uh, complement of a new um, water plant and wastewater plant should we get to that point and we will be coming back to council later in August through the planning committee with an update on where we are there but I would safely say not being uh, the engineer but since none of the engineers can hear us um, that the we've had many conversations and that these are the, the most related to uh, the existing development and have only been designed in a way to fit with the other growth related they are not uh, entirely growth related in and of themselves if I if I could have a follow-up and I'll, I'll direct this through with the uh, through the CAO so the this would then would be within what was anticipated for any works that were done under our current um, water rate and connection charge uh, study Is I do, it, I do it, not know the answer sorry yeah. I'm not, I think it's not as familiar with the rate yeah. study from last time, so I'm not sure if it okay. was in there. I believe we, some there was some mention of work in Wellington, but I'm not sure if this was okay. contemplated or would be part of the next round of uh, work that we are doing. But it was in the 2020 budget. Okay. Any other questions, Councillor Margaretson? Yeah, it's just yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's just a follow up to the questioning, the line of questioning from Councillor Maynard. So as I understand it, the projects that we're contemplating, even the design portion, the aspects of what is required for existing development and future development, that, that um, has been defined and I think what Councillor Maynard was saying, what we need for existing development would be hopefully captured within the costs associated with the rate study. But the future development would be paying for their portion when it comes, when we'll be front ending at the municipality, but future development will pay for their portion. So the excess amount of the water storage tank and from what I see at most of the sanitary line, if not all, and, and, and perhaps a portion of, a good portion of the water main trunk. So I, I just wanna be clear to that the future needs of Wellington are being paid for by future development. Through the chair, that is exactly correct. So while uh, this is the portion that the municipality is upfronting to keep uh, moving forward, but uh, we are calculating the growth related costs uh, comprehensively and uh, um, this, uh, and, and you're right, the, the lines are um, all if not mostly if not all uh, growth related, but the fact that we need to put them in now is related to the installation of the tower. Thank you for that clarity. Any other questions, Councillor Nyman? No, your question got answered. Councillor Maynard, one Sorry. last yeah. question. Yeah, just a yeah, just a follow up. So really, what we're spending is these are pretty significant uh, consulting fees. So is the um, are the the fees for the studies that are necessary for to look at the different options? Are they being apportioned to uh, to growth and to non growth? Uh, through the chair that is correct uh, these are we're at the design stage so we're getting close to actually building something so that th these aren't studies they're well, they're design. going to be the design work so that we can get on with construction so there will at some point then be a, a division between the design that's growth related and design that is uh, non growth related yeah, we, we look at the uh, total project cost of the studies and design work and construction, and then of that uh, element in the system, how much of that is growth related versus how much of that supports existing residents. Okay. So in the end, the, even the study work gets uh, apportioned to growth where it needs to be. Okay, and maybe I won't, obviously we won't have that figured today, but if we could uh, have that before council, I would appreciate it. That is part of the report that is coming to council on, on the Wellington infrastructure uh, conversations, kind of a re reporting back on a conversation we started in February of this year, mm -hmm. and it's coming forward at the planning committee on a, uh, August 12th. No, August 26th. 
Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other hands, I will call the vote. All in favor? And that carries. Six point three report of the clerk's office dated August six, twenty twenty, regarding Prince Edward County quasi judicial committees. Can I have somebody please Councillor St. Jean, Councillor McMahon? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, St. Jean McMahon motion that report CL 08-2020 of the clerk's office be received for information, that the proposed terms of reference for the fence viewers be approved, that the proposed terms of reference for the property standards committee be approved, that the proposed terms of reference for the livestock evaluators be approved, and five, that bylaws for each terms of reference be brought forward to the August 4th council meeting to be enacted. Is there any questions, comments? Seeing none, call the vote. All in favor? And that carries. Thank you. 6.4, report of the finance department dated August 6, 2020 regarding the sale of land by public tender. Would somebody please put this on the floor? <laughs> Councillor Margetson, seconded by Councillor Bailey. It's a Margetson-Bailey motion. That report FIN 10 2020 of the Finance Department dated August 6, 2020, regarding sale of land by public tender be received, and that the outstanding taxes on properties known as roll number 1350511035055000 and 1350511035046601 be written off as uncollectible. And further, that the properties known as roll number 1350-511-35-05500 and 1350-511-035-04601 be vested to the municipality and declared surplus and staff be authorized to take the necessary steps to sell these properties and that the outstanding property taxes on property known as 1350-511-025-13700 do nothing. And further, that the property known as 1350-511-025-13700 be re-advertised for sale with a reduced cancellation price within two years. Any questions or comments from committee? Seeing none, I will call the vote. All in favor? And that carries. 6.5, a resolution by Mayor Ferguson seeking council support to create a tourism management plan. Mayor Ferguson, do you have a seconder for your resolution? I do, Councillor Margotson. Thank you very much, go ahead. Uh, am I on? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the, uh, this is a resolution seconded by um, Councillor Margeson, uh, and I'd like to speak to it after I conclude reading it. Uh, whereas Prince Edward County has a globally recognized reputation for its natural, cultural, culinary, agricultural, heritage am amenities, and Sandbanks Provincial Park that make it an attractive destination for visitors from major urban centers and from elsewhere in Ontario, Canada, and the United States. And whereas the county's tourism season generally begins in late spring and continues throughout the summer, during which time visitors contribute to the local economy by frequenting the county's local retail and service establishments, 
and its beaches, parks, waterfront, and other amenities. And whereas there has been an increase in tourism activity in Prince Edward County that has put significant pressure on county staff, infrastructure, and other resources, and on its natural amenities, business, businesses, and its residents, and whereas the COVID-19 pandemic may continue for months, if not years, and may lead to further unprecedented increases in tourism activity in Prince Edward County, now, therefore, be it resolved that the Council of the Corporation of the County of Prince Edward requests, one, that staff undertake a comprehensive analysis of the effects of increased tourism activity in Prince Edward County in 2020, including, but not limited to, its effects on residents and businesses, roads, parking, traffic, and other infrastructure, waterfront, municipal beaches, other natural amenities and budget implications for 2021, and two, that on the basis of that analysis, staff brings forward to Council no later than March 31st, 2021, a report and recommendations for the implementation of a tourism management plan to begin in 2021, and three, that the objectives of, of the plan consider the health and safety of residents and visitors, an equitable balance between the needs of visitors to the county and the rights of county taxpayers who reside here, maintaining the fabric of our communities and financial implications and opportunities. And if I could just speak to this briefly, Mr. Chair. Um, I think it's fair to say that um, the summer of 2020 has been like um, no other that we've uh, experienced um, the effects of COVID on the way of life in Prince Edward County have been, um, I, I dare say, pretty profound. Um, I do want to commend staff for um, the way in which they have, have had to react to this tourism season um, in light of the COVID pandemic. Um, a lot of pressure has been put on them with, um, you know, to ensure public safety and to implement rules that, um, or bylaws that Council has passed, and I think they've done a terrific job. But given that this year is, st is still unfolding, what I'm asking for, I'm asking Council's support for, is um, one, an analysis of the events of 2020 um, and uh, the effects and the ways in which we have have handled these events through management of um, staff and their assignments and um, just generally speaking um, uh, the, the way in which we have we have dealt with with what has been cast upon us by the, uh, the COVID pandemic, and particularly the influx of people from elsewhere um, who have uh, really realized that they've got no place to go, and they've certainly come to Prince Edward County. And secondarily, or, or as the other, uh, other half of the resolution, that a report and recommendations come forward for implementation in 2021, the resolution states a date of um, March 31st. Uh, if anything, I'd like to amend that and make it more flexible um, in that uh, staff may be able to, to come forward to council quicker uh, or faster than, than March 31st, but um, notwithstanding that coming forward, the plan to be implemented for the summer of 2021 because we don't know what is coming and we, um, I think, um, have to plan better for the same as we got this year, if not um, more so. Um, what I'd like the report and the plan to consider um, also must consider Sandbanks Park. and. While I have the floor, I want to um, mention that I met with Minister Urich yesterday uh, with Councillor Forrester uh, 
our MPP, Todd Smith, and some local business owners. It was very productive. Minister Yurick subsequently went on a tour of Prince Edward County. He was shown video of the effect of traffic on um, the primary intersection out there. I got a report from MPP Smith that he um, appreciated the information and has a much greater understanding of the problems the park presents, uh, not only to the tourists arising, arriving who for the past few Saturdays have lined up for four or five kilometers for multiple hours um, and whose cars are all idling, but that's something that can come forward in a further resolution. Um, um, and it, it's my belief that he is going to take steps to address the park overflows um, and help the municipality with, uh, with our needs. And that was certainly made clear during the, our meeting that, um, you know, 25% increase in OPP calls. Um, also, all the stories I think we've all heard about, um, you know, abuse of, of private property, the overflow effect on uh, our other amenities, such as Point Peter, North Beach, um, you know, the secret beaches, uh, and elsewhere. Um, so he is, he is in possession of that. So just to conclude, because I think this is fairly straightforward, um, I, I, I think the time has come for us to take a, a really comprehensive approach to managing something that has building, been building for quite some time um, to enable um, our visitors to have the experience we want them to have in Prince Edward County, but <clears throat> as importantly, to ensure that our residents have the ability to enjoy the uh, the home they invest in and the uh, the place they pay their taxes. So I'm hopeful I, I can get uh, council support, and I'll answer any questions anyone may have. I have Councillor Margaretson and then Councillor Bailey. Go ahead, Councillor Margaretson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to to second this motion and support it. And although I feel this summer and perhaps the um, issues related with COVID-19 and, and the desire for people to want to access natural areas has, has heightened our awareness of what issues we might have with too many visitors or, or not being able to handle, handle the number of visitors. But I must admit, I've been speaking about this since before this summer. and. I remember during the election, the proliferation of STAs and was an issue and we've had other issues related to tourism and, and whether we're, it's effect, if we're getting the benefits economically, we spoke to about Sandbanks Park at, at conferences to try and get some traction on that. And I feel that this, it, it's overdue and I, I'm hopeful this is going to be a, a a good session to sort of take a, a good look at where we're going in Prince Edward County because I, I know that our corporate strategic priorities and I, I think they were meaningful to me and I hope to other councillors who undertook that exercise, you know, to make a livable community that's livable to all the people that live here and maintaining our rural and historic charm and not getting overrun and infrastructure, financial sustainability, even climate change issues. I think there's a number of things in our, our corporate strategic priorities that could be addressed through a good look at this um, comprehensive analysis of, of the effects of tourism. And I would also echo Mayor Ferguson's comment relating to the date. I know it's no later than March 31st, which is good because it's in the, the first quarter, but there may be budget implications, so hopefully it can be dovetailed with our budget discussions if, if there are impacts, and also give us enough time to implement measures that we feel are required for 2021. So 
That's that's it for me. Thank you. Councillor Bailey. So that would be a rather brief period from study to implementation. Sooner would be better. Did you have a different time in mind or a different date? Well, I will, you know, for that question of the CAO, um, I, I did consult as to what a reasonable window would be because, uh, as I say, it, um, what I'm asking for is a comprehensive analysis, um, how quickly that can be done, recognizing that um, staff are going to be working on budgets, but I, I, you know, I will defer that question to the CAO if, if there's any adjustment to this date that you, um, you can specify or arrange. Through the chair, uh, so when asked about when we could do this, I suggested the um, first quarter of 2021. End of January is still the first quarter of 2021. So I, I, I take the point that we need as much time as possible for implementation. I would like to, as Councillor Margerson pointed out, um, link this to the budget discussions because I think um, that'll be a relevant factor. And we'll, we'll um, so I think if you want to change it, to January 31st, we can make that happen. Okay. Uh, Councillor Hirsch, and then Mr. Chairman. Uh, I too would like to, um, I'd just like to follow on what Councillor Margaretson said and, and completely support uh, this motion, including the earlier date, which I think is a good idea. But just, I'd like to be sure that we're clear on, on the, the total scope here. Um, two places in, in one of the whereas clauses and in clause one, there's a reference to natural amenities. And I want to be sure that we intend that that includes um, environmentally sensitive areas not necessarily owned by the county. So for example, the tremendous issues we've had at, at Little Bluff in the past weekends, that's owned by Quinty Conservation. Point Peter is, is um, MNRF provincial land and that's another problem area. So as long as we can be certain that, that by natural amenities, we mean all of those natural areas which are suffering from um, this, this uh, overflow of tourist traffic, then um, I'd be happy for this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hirsch, Councillor Nyman, and then Councillor Maynard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I said it earlier, and I'll ask this question now. So, in this report, it's going to kind of um, give us ways how we can, um, we, I say the county, um, to make money off the tourists, to help pay for the services that are overburdened during the tourist seasons, such as garbage collection, uh, the roads, all that other um, extra stuff, I guess. So. Is that going to be in the report also? How is there any opportunity where we can uh, increase county coffers at the expense of the tourists, I guess, to help pay for the extra services? Mayor Ferguson, would you like to reply to that? Yes, I will. The um, I would refer uh, Councillor Nyman to number three and the uh, last clause, which is financial implications and opportunities. So the intent is um, to review and find any opportunities for just as the councillor suggests. Thank you, Mayor and Ferguson. Uh, can, oh, do you have one more? J just want to clarify the comment from um, councillor Councillor Hirsch, natural amenities um, was, was uh, you know, I inserted that uh, and that would, in my mind, include South Shore, Little Bluff, and other conservation areas. Uh, Councillor Maynard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I certainly um, support the, the intent of uh, this resolution to ensure that we continue to have or regain a, a, a livable community. I think that, uh, and this, this uh, plan is probably long over 
long overdue, something that uh, planning's always better done before there's a problem than, than after, but uh, better late than never. I, I would think, though, that to have a really comprehensive plan, that it'll take some time, and that maybe if, if part of the intent is to have uh, things in place, some measures in place for next year, that we could possibly look at a, at a staged approach and um, because there may be some things that will, some mitigation measures possibly that will, that will have budget implications. So we will need to see those in the budget. I'm assuming that this year's budget will be, um, will be um, pretty tight. <laughs> so if we could stage it, if we could find some way to, to stage the reporting so that the things that are the, um, that will give us some immediate uh, fixes for the next tourist season can be highlighted while we continue to look at the longer term plans. I think that would give staff a little more leeway because I the the timelines seem pretty seem pretty tight even for the maybe and I'll just ask the mayor for his for his comments on that, like how we try and do this fulsome but the um this is falling on the uh, on the shoulders of of staff um you know i think uh the the resolution is pretty clear in what the desire is um the big part being big parts being obviously the analysis and secondly the plan for 2021 i think um staff of the can have the flexibility to bring forward information they think um, is appropriate for council to consider or deliberate, um, you know, as they go through the, the two options. So I, I don't think we can necessarily specify staging and what stage this and what stage that. Certainly the budget implications are included in this and those will have to be brought forward at, uh, at the appropriate time by staff. Councillor Harper. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm certainly in favor of this. Um, I do want to just emphasize, though, that I think a lot of what uh, we experienced around the county, and certainly in my ward, was a function of uh, sand banks overflow. And, and I just want to make a distinction. You know, tourists aren't a homogenous group. They consist of a number of different segments. And I think um, you could argue that a lot of the problems that we've seen the last couple of weekends are not tourists in the sense of people who are uh, bringing, um, coming for a number of days and, and spending money on hospitality or accommodation or buying things. They're bringing their coolers uh, to have a picnic and ideally a swim and then head home that night. So I think a lot of what we're really talking about here is uh, involves sandbanks and what their policy is. And so I think the timing on it uh, is, is you know, somewhat dependent on what successes we can have in working with sandbanks. So I just want to acknowledge that uh, uh, that I, that for me at least is a, is a cornerstone of the solving this problem is is the province's ability to help us with the capacity uh, issue that we clearly are facing. Councillor Maynard, did you have one more comment? Uh, uh, just a quick follow up. First of all, I think the issues with tourists have uh, been pretty uh, pretty apparent for for uh, quite a few years now but my question really is about I don't see anything about uh, and maybe just to staff I, I'm sh I'm assuming that public consultation the broad public consultation will be uh, will be part of a report there's lots of people that would like to weigh in on this topic <laughs> madam CAO do you have a comment through the chair um, so like with any policy or program or um, significant change we'd bring forward, we'd look to find ways to consult. I, I would say that there are other consultations ongoing. There's a transportation and cycling strategy. There's a parking strategy. There's a tourism strategy. These are all things that are already underway or, or um, in process that will have consultation. So not presupposing where this tourism management plan might need to go and what remaining consultation will need to occur. We would certainly take that into consideration. Thank you. 
Uh, nobody else on my oh, councillor Roberts with a late entry. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair, for your tolerance and flexibility. Um, over tourism, I don't think is going to go away. Um, uh, none of us are prophets, nor the children of them, so it's hard to predict the future. But I suspect that venues or cities or counties or regions that are identified as hot spots because of you know really uh, good marketing will continue to see over tourism. So how we do our marketing might want to be part of this consideration uh, and what we look at as well. And also, I'm not sure it's just about getting something out of it in terms of cash from tourists, but it is that. You know, it is that, absolutely. I agree with Councillor Nyman on that. But also, is there a way of looking at our tourism industry which provides preferential treatment to tourists, to, excuse me, not to tourists, preferential treatment to residents and locals? Um, that may be another way of addressing benefits uh, for people that actually live here full time. So I'd just like those two things to be part of the mix. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. I will now call the vote. All in favor? And that carries. Uh, we're at the two-minute time, so as chair, I will say we'll take 10 minutes and only 10 minutes. So if you need to do what you need to do, be back here in 10 minutes. In motion 2019-433 as amended, and whereas the municipality of the County of Prince Edward made a commitment to use all tools available to reduce those human activities that are causing the climate emergency, and whereas the impact of transportation on the natural environment and human health is a key component of a climate change mitigation strategy to reduce impacts of human activities, and whereas Reducing unnecessary vehicle idling is a universal approach to reducing environmental impact of vehicles emissions. Now, for, therefore, be it resolved that Council request staff to provide a report by the end of 2020 to investigate a County of Prince Edward anti-idling policy in order to, one, guide the municipality in the operation of its fleet and the delivery of services, to provide public education about the environmental, economic, and health impacts of idling to reduce idling behavior. And three, consider an idling control bylaw. Would you like to speak? Sure, I'll speak to it. Um, I, I think the, the motion and what's contained within it is fairly self-explanatory. I, I think that the way I crafted it was to um, not necessarily believe that we need a control bylaw, but consider it. I think the um, environmental and economic and the human health, and, which is created to our environment, the impacts are fairly self-explanatory with respect to idling. And because of our own fleet, we have an opportunity to um, lead by example too within the municipality. And just further to that, I think this somewhat uh, speaks to the amount of vehicles that come to the county, and I'm hoping that perhaps as we reconsider our tourism marketing or management strategy that um, we can perhaps frame the, in this municipality as an environmentally conscious leader in, in environmental stewardship and measures to reduce climate change so that people coming to the county will know that for instance that we are an anti-idling municipality and that we would want to lead as you know through our attitude and our own behaviors and that could spread through the community and be reflected in the way we do business this is just a start i hope so thank you mr chair for that thank you councillor margaretson uh councillor nyman then Councillor Hirsch. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I support this, but I'd like to maybe ask staff uh, if they would bear in mind, since this is coming forward, that uh, any place that we can and, uh, and also push the MTO for roundabouts, because 
how much idling is at uh, stoplights? You look at the liquor store uh, intersection in Picton, how backed up traffic is there? County Road uh, 62 and one's a, a good place for a roundabout, the number, amount of traffic that's there. And I'll go back to no frills and, and the Sobeys, or I guess it's Sobeys. That's where we should have had it because the amount of traffic that's going to be at that intersection, and it's a street, a street light, and the amount of idling that's going to happen there. But I still support this, but we've missed some opportunities. So we need to really push for roundabouts to keep the traffic moving and there's no idling. Thank you, Councillor Hyman. Councillor Hirsch, then Councillor Bailey. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I support this completely as well. Um, and, and would like to report something that due to timing, unfortunately, um, it's not possible to have an official response to this from the Environmental Advisory Committee, but uh, at our meeting last week, we were aware that this was coming. There was a conversation. Um, Catalina is going to kill me here, but um, there was a conversation and I can report that even though it's not an official statement of the Environmental Advisory Committee, there was not one member opposed to the concept of an idling bylaw. So um, full support. Thank you. Councillor Bailey. With track circles, um, definitely this should hopefully lead to more of those. And as, an, as also a member of the Environment Committee, fully in support of this myself, and I think I can speak for the majority of the committee. Everybody was in favor of this. Thank you. Is there any other comments or questions? I guess I'll, uh, I'll just ask staff, is this date, I assume Councillor Margaretson had a, had a chat with you, is this date doable or is it? Uh, through the chair, yes it is. Thank you. Just to clarify, Councillor Roberts, yes? Yeah, question to, I mean, I support this absolutely. It's, it's great. Um, and I thank, I thank Ernie for doing it. Um, my ex experience, maybe others have this experience, is that the greatest idling problem is with drive through eating facilities. So, do you, does staff anticipate that we might be able to address that through this initiative? I mean, we see, I don't know, 30 cars idling out, you know, in a Tim Hortons line. Uh, Madam through, CAO, you want to take a shot at through Tim the chair, Hortons and how to speed them up? <laughs> through the chair, I, I don't think that the municipality has the tools. Once they have the zoning and are able to operate a drive through I don't think we have the tools to um, influence how they operate other than... Um, Perhaps how traffic gets managed, but um, but I take your point. But for new franchises, new businesses of that nature, we could be a little bit more directive. Yeah, that's a fair point. We can certainly take a look at that. Okay, thanks, uh, Councillor Bullock. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, um, I I want to congratulate Councillor Markinson for this elegant solution because uh, it's easy to do and it doesn't cost the municipality anything to implement. Um, certainly, uh, roundabouts seem to be preferable for certain people. So I know some people hate roundabouts. Um, I can, from experience, speak to phased lights. I know in Europe it's really big. Uh, they're ahead of us on a lot of these green initiatives. But uh, I know getting through Picton can be a real chore. You tend to get a red wave, not a green wave. And perhaps we can look at uh, in the future, synchronizing our lights so that through traffic doesn't keep running into red lights. So that uh, if you're driving at a certain speed from the east to the west or the west to the east, you get green light after green light, and uh, that would certainly cut back on idling as well. So again, the, the gist of this, um, the, the no idling bylaw, encouraging people to turn their engines off when they don't need to be on, is uh, easy and cheap. So certainly... As seconder, I will support this. Thank you, Councillor Bullock. Mayor Ferguson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to uh, follow up on the comment I made about uh, meeting Minister Yurick yesterday, who, uh, apart from having uh, sandbags as part of his uh, portfolio, also has the environment. 
Um, and I made the, after I showed him a video of four and a half kilometers of um, idling cars on on, uh, count, on East Lake Road and West Lake Road leading into the park, um, made the point that um, we are, that there is there is an effect on the environment by the uh, the situation that is now in the park, and he he understood that. So I just wanted to add that comment. Thank you for that. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, I will call the vote. All in favor? And that carries. Six point seven. Uh, 6.7, a resolution by Councillor McNaughton seeking council support to declare a temporary whole home STA application moratorium. Councillor McNaughton, you have the floor if you have a seconder. Uh, a couple people mentioned that they would second, so if anyone wants to, go for it. Councillor so, St. Jean, I saw a hand over here to my left eye. So uh, this is the McNaughton St. Jean motion where... Um, and I'll read the resolution. Whereas we cannot, due to the effects of the pandemic, fully assess the STA program, the uh, short-term accommodation program, for functionality at the time of its scheduled review, and whereas there is still an affordable, meaningful, meaningfully attainable housing crisis in Prince Edward County, and Council should do everything in its power to preserve residential housing stock. Therefore, be it resolved that Council direct staff to outline any impediments to and investigate the steps required to declare a moratorium as of November 1st, 2020 on new whole home short-term accom accommodation license applications as outlined in bylaw 4518-2019 and to report back to Council at a Council meeting on or before September 22nd and that these steps and any resulting restrictions or bylaw amendments, if approved by council, would remain in place until the county is fully able to evaluate the existing licensing program for efficacy. So, and go may ahead. I go ahead? Yep. Thank you. So, um, it's interesting today how many of the motions on this agenda relate to each other, and it's clear that it's on a lot of our minds uh, that we're thinking about how to make, how to, to keep this, keep the elements of this community livable that are still livable, and to try to preserve um, as much as we can for residents uh, a, a real true community. And this motion is looking to outline the steps that would be required to temporarily pause short-term accommodation applications in the near future. And if we committed to the steps outlined to do so, it would be, um, it would be a temporary measure that would only be in place until that time that we can assess the program as it is and determine whether it addresses the problems that it was originally created to address. And this goes right back to the initial problems identified participant by participants in the original consultation uh, by both the public and to, to councils um, relating to housing affordability, uh, concerns about ghost streets, concerns about ghost neighborhoods, um, and trying to um, aid affordability by allowing residents to uh, participate in the, the tourist economy uh, but not necessarily sacrifice housing. Um, when it's come up, we've heard and we've been referred to uh, a program evaluation in 2021, but we don't know whether the STA bylaw program is successful in its design and its scope, and as this has been such a bizarre year, uh, we probably won't be able to get a clear picture And when we do reassess it. So... Um, Plus, we've already we've not had an opportunity to apply the lessons learned at LPAT challenges in other communities throughout Ontario, notably Toronto, which which lets us know that our program could have gone down uh, some of the pathways that were considered uh, that were considered um, indefensible potentially uh, at a tribunal. So uh, it appears now that we still have pressures. Uh, on our on our real estate market that we didn't necessarily anticipate uh, in the wake of COVID. And in the early days of COVID, at least I expected that there might be some cooling, uh, but we 
are still making headlines and we're still getting extraordinary attention and some purchasers might still be considering temporary moves until COVID winds down. Some might be permanent, some might not. We don't know the outcome, but I think we should try to be predictable for people who are looking to purchase homes in the county right now. And there remain possible risks at this time that some of those units might be added to this program in the meantime. And then that use is gonna be embedded in that property's permitted uses in perpetuity. So uh, if there was a way to open that program up right now, instead of looking at the steps for a moratorium, I think that would be great. There would be nice to find ways to make this program more favorable for local residents who wish to share or temporarily share their home, if they're, for example, if they're away, um, if they're away for a few weeks, to aid in the affordability uh, of their own homes and to exclude other home home applications. But we did, that's not the program that we have right now. It's not the program that we signed on to. And a full program review might give us an avenue to do that, but I don't think that's possible right now uh, for several considerations, including probably staff workload. When we uh, ratified the STA bylaw, councillors three, uh, three at least identified a moratorium as on their list of priorities. I think at this time, uh, we need to start taking it even more seriously. So um, that's where I, that's uh, what I was thinking when I uh, put, this on the, put this on the floor. Thank you very much. I will now open the floor to questions or comments from committee members. Councillor St. Jean, I'll start with you and then we'll go to Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I wholeheartedly agree with Councillor McNaughton on this issue. Uh, I, I, my preference a number of months ago would have been to uh, uh, include a moratorium in the initial bylaw. If we're ever going to get a handle on the situation as it affects our, our, our housing needs or lack, lack of housing, uh, I, I think that would have been an ideal first step. Uh, also, I believe we shouldn't have been, uh, uh, <clears throat> I think there was a, there's a problem with allowing people to sell their, sell their businesses in a residential neighborhood but that's another battle I'll fight later when we come back with the uh, review of the, the entire bylaw. The only other suggestion I might make is that uh, given the, the, the uh, anticipated, at least I anticipate some public uh, outcry and, and uh, wish to participate in the conversation, that it not come to council, that it come to the committee of the whole meeting on the 24th to allow for greater public participation and discussion as well as council discussion. So that would be my only suggestion. Councillor McNaughton. To, to the mover. Are you okay with that? Or are you, are you... Oh, for sure. No, I, I, I'm just getting back in line after no, that's Councillor fine. I Roberts. Just didn't know. He, I, there's... he wanted to make a, what I'm seeing as a friendly amendment. So I was wondering if you're okay with it coming back to the committee whole oh, instead yeah, of council. Oh yeah, I anticipated it would come to committee the whole first. Okay, so totally. So... We'll 100%. call that a friendly amendment right now. Councillor Roberts? Um, I think in large part the, the jury's kind of in already on whole home uh, Airbnb short-term accommodation. Uh, Harvard Business Review, Forbes Magazine, Globe and Mail Report on Business, not what I would call, well, I would call them very business friendly. And they've all reached the conclusion or their editorial boards have reached the conclusion that uh, the cost of the impact on on rental, the rental market, the available rental market, on on you know housing stock for families either to rent or to purchase, and the negative impact on communities themselves far outweigh the benefits to individual property owners and to tourism itself. I think Councillor McNaughton and Councillor Hirsch and I were at a conference where a presentation from McGill was made. A uh, pretty interesting professor from McGill. He's updated that research recently, and uh, and it too is pretty scary with regard to whole home uh, short-term accommodation. Uh, the uh, the um, this kind of saccharine Airbnb uh, motto, you know, modus operandi of allowing my great aunt to keep her townhouse by renting out a room is far from the reality of what's going on out there. Uh, 60,000, more than 60,000 homes have been taken off the housing rental market for families uh, because of short-term accommodations. And more and more, it's corporations. 
So uh, pretty much 10% of, of, uh, of the Airbnb listings are multiple listings, and, uh, and that those multiple listings represent pretty close to 35% of the whole STA revenue. So it's, it's not my great aunt. These are corporations calling in from New Jersey. So I'm very much in support of Councillor McNaughton's um, uh, motion here, and uh, we should all be. Thanks. Councillor McNaughton. Uh, I did forget to mention something, that this is only one small piece of the puzzle. There are all kinds of things that we can do to, um, to uh, foster a healthier housing market for, for people who live here. Um, but this is just one small first step. And, uh, in, yeah, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Maynard, then Councillor Hirsch. Thank you. I just, uh, I, I am in support of, uh, of this, uh, this motion. I just had a question on the, um, the whole home, whether, whether the, we make allowances for those people that are renting their whole home but are maintaining it as their principal residence and are actually living there other than during the uh, tourist season where they vacate somewhere else to... Uh, to live. Councillor McNaughton, do you want to respond? There is, currently, I don't believe there's a distinction in our program, and that I believe is something that we should be looking at for that, uh, for when we are able to reevaluate fully, because uh, it would be a great tool for affordability for people who live here, who go to their trailer for the summer, or, or something. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then they can afford that trailer uh, and um, would be uh, more in keeping with the initial problems outlined. Do you have a follow-up, Councillor Maynard? Is, can we use that just as direction as opposed to amending the motion that, the, that we... Um, that maybe we do some work on the definition of a whole home short-term accommodation. Direction. I, I would think that's would, be taken as direction. Yeah. Councillor Hirsch. Yes. Chairman, um, I'd just like to have council recall that when we passed this bylaw, at that point in time, staff said to us, well, let's see how this goes, and there's a lot of balls in the air in other jurisdictions as well. And one of those was that at the time last year, the City of Toronto had passed a bylaw banning whole home STAs, which was challenged by the Airbnb folks uh, at LPAT. Well, that appeal has since been settled in favor of the City of Toronto, so whole home STAs are not allowed in the, the largest metropolis in this country. So I think adding to what Councillor Roberts said, there's, there's plenty of guidance as to the desirability of these, and um, they wouldn't appear to be desirable, so I can support uh, the motion. Thank you, Councillor Hirsch. Councillor Roberts, did I see your hand go up again? <clears throat> Just a suggestion. There are, there, are, there are places like Barcelona, Vienna, Copenhagen, who have come to terms with the issue that uh, uh, Councillor Maynard was raising, so they've given a definition to short-term accommodation, which is they, p they pick a number, 28 days a year, uh, 33 days a year, something like that. So there's, you know, we don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel, but a research, and it could work. Thanks. Councillor Margotson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My, my question is related to the date and how that came about. And I, I think I heard you say that you would prefer it to be earlier. Is that true? Oh, well, you know, I'm impatient. I'd prefer it to be now. So, so, but I, I can wait. I'm learning patience. So the date came defer, from staff. It, it did not, it, I, but I, I did run it by, uh, I ran the motion by the CAO before putting it on the agenda. And I, I tried to sort of give what I thought was a reasonable bit of rope, but I don't know if, if it's, too luxurious or not luxurious enough, I'm open to hear um, to hear alternatives. So, 
the reason I ask, of course, is because we've heard about the negative consequences and that there's precedent in within the city of Toronto. So I just wondered mm -hmm. if a, if that moratorium date could be moved up. That's that's my question to staff, I guess. Great question. Madam CAO, the most common question, is that doable? You're getting it again. <laughs> well. um, uh, through the chair, uh, if, if we're not doing a review or change of anything in the program, we're simply bringing forward a moratorium on new uh, I think this um, motion is, or this resolution is trying to see if we could look at both and, and see if there's some uh, short-term improvements, no pun intended, uh, <laughs> to the ST, STA um, program. I, I think that if we're to just bring a resolution forward, we could do that sooner. To, to do any kind of look at some fixes to avoid a reactive approach, which I think has plagued this uh, Council for the balance of the summer so far. Uh, I think that we would need the time allotted here. So I think it's it's council's choice. If you just want to do a um, uh, a moratorium and then we study and we come back, we could do that much quicker. But uh, and then I would just be looking for enough days' notice so that we could write to all of the operators that have been talking to us um, so that people. Have and, and we can publicize that this is happening so that people have ample notice that this is coming into place for fairness, but, um, but that part could move a lot quicker. Follow-up? Well, that would be my preference, to, to do the moratorium, which is standalone, and the, the broader implication at, uh, assessment would, could take longer. So. I would move that if, if, if well, we wanted I, to separate that out. Or I think that's how it's written. Yeah. So. Okay. Councillor St. Jean, did I see your hand go up? Yeah. Th th thank you, Mr. Chair. So through you to uh, CAO. So it's my understanding that if we separate this out to strictly the, the, the intention of the moratorium, we could choose a date of September 1st, October 1st, doesn't have to be November 1st because it's a, it's a straightforward motion. Is that correct? Correct. And it would not come back with the report. It would come back like in the same way that we bring a resolution or a bylaw forward. I think that would be wonderful because as I've stated, I, I think that was a component of our initial bylaw that was missing, installing a moratorium. And it sends a very clear message immediately. <clears throat> the other aspects of, of the resolution definitely are going to take more time. So let, I would be supportive of separating those two so that it's very clear to, to uh, and I'll call them, the investors that are coming here to take advantage of our community that we're not going to allow that immediately. So. So we got the, the seconder who is looking at the, the mover to change the date for the moratorium, is that what I'm hearing? I, I'm not. Are you? Yeah, I think so. Is that what that is? I'm, can, Madam CAO, go ahead. <laughs> Through the chair, I think when I, um, and I'll look to the clerk to help improve the wording of the resolution, but I think what is being discussed is a moratorium that we would bring forward in September. It's, so bring the motion itself instead of uh, a report about we, the steps. So we would uh, separate it as two clauses, that the a moratorium would be brought forward for council to pass in September and a um, report on the whole home short-term accommodation you know, a report. I don't know if it would be a full program review, but yeah. depending on what date you give us, but, uh, but we certainly could report back on the program and our... I wasn't actually looking for a report on the program it, within this wording. I was really, I, I believe that's already anticipated for 2021. Mm -hmm. So you're looking so for a moratorium is basically just the moratorium, all you're looking for. That's and we'll what get I was the report always looking for. Because it's already on the, yeah. on the books for Q1 yeah. or Q2 next year. Yeah, I think it was Q1 2021. Whatever, yeah, it, I just don't want to. Okay. Yeah. So you're looking. So really, I, you, it's just the date that should be in question here. So you want to change here. the date to? Whatever is possible. Madam, Madam Clerk. Okay. 
<laughs> through the chair. Um, so then it would just be instead of, you know, I heard around um, the chambers, our new chambers, that it would be a committee's meeting on September 24th, but it could be changed to a council meeting on either September um, 20th, I don't know the date right in front of me. Be the 20th. Or the 24th, or it could be September 1st. Is September 1st doable? So if through the chair, so, so if it's September 1st, the report will just explain how the moratorium would work yes. and explain when, uh, what the scope of the larger review is and when that would come in 2021, that, that is doable. So, yes. So seeing so lots of head nods for the September 1st council meeting uh, of a moratorium on whole home SGAs, is that? So it's good go, with me. Go ahead. Is uh, that good with you? Yes. Okay, Councillor Councillor Nyman, I'm going to interrupt you for a second. No, Councillor Nyman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So if it's coming back September the 1st, what would be the date in that the moratorium starts? Madam Clerk. Through the chair, the motion right now states November 1st, and that is for, for fairness and, and just, but it can be changed and moved up um, if council wishes to do so. Okay, so we got lots of dates going on here. We are now into a September 1st council meeting and looking at the mover, I'm assuming she wants like an October 1st or I'm just putting, or is, are you happy with November 1st as the moratorium date? Um, or we could change the wording to the earliest possible opportunity, something. Because we've gone, we've gone around and around. We wanted to push it. We've got it to September we do want 1st. To, okay, so I, no, but uh, we've got it to September 1st and if we're leaving the moratorium at November 1st, then we're right back to the original. So, so shall we say October 1st? You? That's it's your resolution. I'm looking McNally. at him. I'm looking at the seconder. Let's just be fair. That's all. I I my preference would be September first. For for the the moratorium to come for, into effect. For the moratorium to come. <laughs> lots of hands going up now. I got lots of head nods and they're not good. So I will go to Madam Clerk, and then we'll if she, okay. Go ahead. the day okay so would it be best to leave that date open for legal reasons until that night or how do you want to or you want to put a date in there now I just worry that if it's you know we have to give it so many days I don't want to be talking about that again. Go ahead. Do we have Mr. Chair discussions with the CAO? Uh, we can just add the words as of October 1st, 2020, and then parentheses if possible. Okay. Perfect. Good, thank you. We got lots of head nods now. Council, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we're going for, it's coming to the September 1st council meeting with a date of October 1st, if possible. Is that correct? So that's the friend, friendly amended resolution from Councillor McNaughton, second by Councillor Jean. I will call the vote, all in favor. And that carries. Somebody wanna Holler at Councillor Harper and see if he wants to come back. <laughs> While he comes back, we'll go to 6.8, a resolution by Councillor Maynard seeking council support to establish an interim control bylaw within PEC regarding the cultivation, processing, and production of cannabis. Councillor Maynard, do you have a seconder for your resolution? I haven't, uh, I don't have a uh, one Can situated. <laughs> 
Who, take you, your, you pick. <laughs> I will take your fellow Amelia'sburg Councilor, Councilor McMahon. Okay. Thank you. I'll read the, uh, the motion um, or the resolution. Whereas, per Section 38 of the Planning Act, an interim control bylaw may be in effect for up to one year while a land use planning study is completed. Therefore, be it resolved that Council direct staff to undertake a land use planning report on the impact of cannabis cultivation, processing, and production, and consider policies to regulate such uses within the county, and that Council direct staff to prepare an interim control bylaw to prohibit any new or expanded cultivation, processing, or production of cannabis in the county by the end of Q3 2020, and that any prohibition arising from the interim control bylaw shall not apply to the cultivation of up to four plants on any property for personal consumption. Go okay. ahead and speak to it. Yeah. So, um, due to some recent complaints and concern and angst, um, there is the option to have an interim control bylaw that will allow staff up to a year to come back uh, to do a land uh, use planning study, and uh, but to to uh, initiate that, you have to have uh, said resolution that I have just read directing them to do so. Um, I did include just on the agenda was just a, a sample of what a. Uh, municipality has used as the extra in, in uh, interim control bylaw but currently in the in the county um, we, we don't have anything in our zoning bylaws or we don't have any restrictions that speak uh, that speak to the uh, to the cultivation process or production of cannabis so this will allow us um, a year to uh, to have that land use planning study done um, I know that uh, that there have been inquiries from people um, looking to see what our uh, where where our um, what sorry inquiries regarding permissions or prohibitions within the, within the county. Um, there has been complaints from residents, uh, especially those near grow up, citing um, noise, smell disturbance, light trespass, and distance requirements from residential uses, all of which could be, um, could be addressed in a, uh, in, a, in a bylaw, in a zoning bylaw. Um, and this was something I didn't know that although um, licenses to produce and cultivate cannabis capped at four plants per person, Health Canada has granted authority to provide medical certificates to individuals to exceed that four plant limit. And in extreme cases, we have um, what are called master growers growing many thousands of, uh, growing thousands of plants. And um, so these operations are set up with really uh, no uh, municipal approval process in place. So, um, doo -doo -doo. just kind of skip through some of this, I don't have to read them. Um, so yeah, we're required to uh, pass this resolution to undertake a planning review, and, th and that would give staff the time to, um, to look at the issues, like things such as required separation distance to, to neighboring properties, nuisance odor reductions within close proximity to neighboring properties, light and light waste directives, approved locations within the community, size of operations permitted, et cetera. Thank you. Questions or comments? I saw Councillor McNaughton. Yeah. Um, thank you. I just want to I thank you for bringing this motion forward. It's it's rock solid. I went to have a look at one that was on County Road 28. We stopped the car maybe 300 meters away, uh, and uh, I was convinced, uh, as was my daughter that we should be having minimum distance separation <laughs> formula for, for grow ups because it, it was really unpleasant and I can't fathom being one of the neighbors. So thank you. Councillor mm -hmm. St. Jean. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I, I too will be supporting the, this uh, uh, motion by Councillor Maynard. Uh, 
I have a lot of questions. Uh, you know, by no means am I against people growing their own marijuana for whatever purposes. But the, the thing that concerns me in our community is do, and this is a question for staff, do we know where they all are? Do we know if they are federally licensed? And what controls, three questions, what controls and measures can we take outside of this to ensure that a, we know where they are and that they are licensed? Okay. Madam CAO. Uh, through the chair, well, with regards to the question of where they are, I, uh, I, I do not know that answer, but that will certainly be part of uh, what we look at. And in bringing back an interim control bylaw response to this resolution, I, I will make sure that that report outlines what our authority as a municipality is or isn't. I, I wouldn't want to raise expectations that uh, uh, the time we take to do a study can achieve something that it can't. So we, we'll be clear. Uh, there, um, the example that was provided by Councillor Maynard in the agenda package is very helpful, but there are al also a number of other municipalities, rural municipalities struggling with this same issue, and so I think there's a lot of um, support we can get by reaching out to some of those um, municipalities to determine uh, what your options are as a council and as a municipality. So uh, take your uh, points. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Maynard. Just a, what I sh what I shouldn't have what I should have mentioned is that uh, an interim control bylaw will not uh, restrict what is currently uh, currently um, occurring. Um, it could restrict any um, any expansion of of uh, existing facilities. But uh, this is just a first step before um, before we have this problem in numerous in more and more areas in the county and I think there there is a good amount of uh, this I didn't want it to be too onerous on staff but I mean Haldeman County and the Niagara region they're all have similar you know similar um, interim control bylaws or, or zoning uh, planning uh, studies underway thank you any further comments questions from committee Seeing none, I will now call the vote. All in favor? And that carries. Uh, seven, adjournment. Um, Councillor Bullock would like to make this motion. He's got the farthest drive home. And Councillor Harper will second it. Councillor Bullock, it's on to you. Thank you. As uh, Bullock Harper motion that we that this meeting adjourn at 3.50 p.m. All in favor? And that carries. Thank you very much, everybody. Don't go too far. <laughs>